Isn't it a wonderful day when you get to experience a baptism? Amen. All right, this morning I'd like to talk to you about baptism. The title of this message is called Buried with Christ. Keep your Bibles open to Romans chapter 6. For here we find Paul giving us a very clear explanation of why and what baptism means. When you look at chapter 6 from verse 1, Paul is making an argument about grace. And he, in this argument, is explaining that God's grace is sufficient for all of your sin. And it will cover every sin, and you can be pardoned of it. But Paul also makes it plain that the power of Christ will give you freedom of bondage from sin. So, chapter 6, verse 1 begins with what? Ricky, can you read that for me? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what's the answer to that? Well, we find that in verse 2. What is it? Certainly, Certainly not. not. So understand this. That as Christians, we have a responsibility. We are to show the world the truthfulness of God in Christ. You ever really fully understand why you are called the hands and the feet of Jesus? Linda asks for us not to forget about all of the refugees fleeing Syria and other parts of the war-torn Middle East. And they're trying to make their way over to Europe. And nobody wants them. Now let me ask you a question. How are we to show that Jesus is real, that his love is real? We pray, God, please help them. Please do something for them. When God is saying, I will. I want to use you to do that. You don't have to go to another country. You don't have to go to another continent. God wants you to be in the hands and feet of Jesus here. Baptism shows the world that you have united with Jesus Christ. That you have Him living in your hearts. So, shall we then continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, certainly not. How shall we, who what? Die to sin, live any longer in it. Or do you not know that as many of us as were what? So what does baptize, or baptism symbolize? Baptism symbolizes the death to sin and the resurrection of new life in Christ. Now, is there any confusion that Paul is saying that there is victory over sin here? That in Christ there is power over sin? Because what was the question? Well, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? What's his answer? So is there power in the blood? Yes. Is there victory in Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you have to continue to live and be slaves to that sin? Now, here is the human experience. If we only had to deal with one sin, that would be great, don't you think? But the problem is, is we deal with multitudes of different sin. And so, the Christian life, when you're baptized, are you baptized and you come out of that water as a mature adult Christian, or are you referred to as a babe in Christ? Why is that? Because God understands you're but dust, and He understands that you have a fallen nature, and that you need to grow in Christ. So what God does is that He gives you all the grace to cover every sin you'll ever do, but He also gives you the power to grow in Christ and to start gaining victory over those sins. 
Now those of you who have walked with Jesus Christ for a long period of time, you know what I'm talking about. You know that there are things... I almost fell off that steps. Did you see that? <laughs> Thank you. Stay right here. <laughs> One more time. Those of you who have walked with Jesus Christ for a number of years know this to be true. And that is the sins that you used to do when you were first baptized. A lot of those you've gained the victory of. But what you know is that there are other sins in your life that you still haven't gained the victory of. And there may still be that sin that is very hard to overcome. That you were dealing with it when you were first baptized and you're still dealing with it now. Does that mean you're a failure in Christ? No. What it means is that you're human and that you're real. But it also means that Christ is just as real as your brokenness and your sin. And that if you continue to grow in His grace, there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that He cannot give you the victory over. Amen. But that takes a mature faith. So, Paul tells us here, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, in verse 4, this is uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? This is how you tell a real Christian. If you knew them before they accepted Christ, and you know them now, there should be a change in their life. A change that you can see. Because Christ does not leave you in the pig pen. Right? The story of the prodigal son. I love that story. The boy wanted all the inheritance he could get from his father. And did he get it? He got the inheritance. He moved away from dad so dad couldn't see what he was going to do with that inheritance. And he did exactly what the older brother said he would do. Right? He was a miserable failure. And when he came to his senses, where did he find himself at? Now, what is a good Jewish boy doing in the middle of a pig pen? That should be the last place you should find him. Is that right? But listen. He comes to his senses and he realized the pigs are eating better than he is. And his mind goes back to his father. And he doesn't think to himself, well, you know, I messed up so bad, my father will never talk to me again. What does he say? He says, man, there are servants at my father's house who are treated better than I am, and they are living better and eating better than me. What I will do is I will go back to my father and not be a son, but I'll be a servant. Because that would be a better life than the life I'm living now. And so he rehearses this whole speech while he's walking home. Now, when he gets close to his father's house, what is the father actually doing? The father is looking and watching. Now, do you think the father received an email or a text message or a Twitter message saying, the boy's coming home now, you better be ready? How did the father know to sit on a porch and watch? Because what that's telling you is that he did that every day since the boy left. That's also telling you the father knew exactly what the boy was going to do with that money. But the difference between the father and the older brother is where was the older brother at? He was doing what he did every day. He was out in the field working, living his life, taking care of the responsibilities. See, now the father, his heart was with his son. He just wanted to see his son come home. That's how God sees each and every one of us. So you know the story. The boy's coming down the street. He's still rehearsing his speech, right? And he comes up to the father, and he's rehearsing this speech. And does the father let him get the speech out? No. What does the father do? 
Now, do you realize that in Jewish society, running was something that a man did not do? Do you know why? Well, number one, they wore man dresses back then. <laughs> now, when you ran, you just don't know what, how far that thing was going to <laughs> So, a man did not run. And this is why Jesus put this in the story. Because his hearers understood that. And that was something that struck them right to their core. The father loved his prodigal so much that he ran to him. And when he ran to him, what did he do? He kissed his neck. And then he put something around him. Now, now let me ask you a question. When this boy came to his senses, did he go into the father's house, change his clothes, and take a shower? No. So he came home still with all the stuff and the pig pen still on him. Right? And when the father came, the father said, Oh, well, oh, oh, you take a bath first, then come into the house. No. The father came and the father told his servants, Get the robe. And they put the robe over all that mess. Right? No one's that robe symbolize? Righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ. So do you understand that in your fallenness, this isn't about you or what you have to offer. This is about you fully understanding that this is what you are. You just come out of the pig pen. And without Christ, that's where you will always be. But Christ takes His righteousness and He puts it around you. And you are as clean as He is. That's what imputed righteousness means, right? Can you, can you buy something that's imputed? Right? It's unmerited favor. God gives it to you, not because you deserve it, but because He loves you. And He took this kid, and He gave him this robe, put it on him, and then He gave him something else. Do you remember what that was? What did the ring symbolize? Now see, I, 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 I got to tell you, man, if that was my kid, I'd be telling him, you got to take a bath first. Because you smell. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you tracking this stuff into the house. <laughs> Father said, you are my son. Here is a robe. And now here is the ring. And what does the ring symbolize? It represents authority. Meaning that you're not going to come back as a slave. You're going to come back as a son. With the full authority of a son. As a part of the family. Right? Now, did the boy deserve this? No. Did he do anything to deserve it? Because if you remember, he did everything not to deserve it. This is the difference between the younger son and the older son. When the older son came back, did he feel entitled? He felt entitled to everything that the father. Your inheritance isn't yours. You're not giving it to me. I earned it. I have worked for you like a slave every day. And have you killed the fatted calf for me? And then he goes, but look at this, your other son. Now, he didn't say, now look at my brother, right? Your other son. And you do all this for him? What does he deserve? And the answer to that is what you and I deserve. Absolutely nothing. Death, as Ricky said. And yet God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in Him, you will not perish, but you can have everlasting life. Amen. And when you come to that knowledge, and you accept that, then God says, for you to be baptized, to show in a physical way, show the world that you've made a commitment. Amen. Now listen, when you're baptized, you go into that water, why? Why does the pastor put that cloth over your mouth and dunk you into the water? What does that symbolize? Death and burial. Right? That is that old man, that old nature. And that is dying. We have died with Christ 
And if we die with Christ, we will be raised with Christ. So when you come out of that water, what does that represent? New life. As Jesus was resurrected, as you're put down into the baptismal waters of death, you come out resurrected and in a new life, a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing on in Romans, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. And let's look at verse 27. Well, actually, let's look at verses 26 and 27. Verse 26 says, For you are all, what? Sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have also put on who? So, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And that change is that now Christ lives inside of you. Galatians also tells us that I am crucified with Christ. And yet I live. Yet it's no longer I who live, but it's what? Christ. Christ who lives in me. How does Christ live inside of you? That's through the presence and the power of His Holy Spirit. Okay, now, let's go to... Hmm, give me a second here. Let me figure out which one. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. How was Jesus baptized and is it important? Do you realize that everything that Jesus did was done as an example? Do you understand that when he came to live here as a human, that he did not ever ever do His will? He didn't wake up this morning and says, you know, I feel like going to the beach. I'm tired of working. I need a vacation. Every day that He lived, He lived in submission, full submission to the will of His Father. And so everything that He did, especially from when He started His ministry, was done for a purpose, so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. So Matthew chapter 1 I'm sorry, it is Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. You got that, Ricky? Yeah. You read it for us? It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John and Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus never sinned, why was he baptized? He was baptized as an example, but there was a reason for it. What does the word anointing mean? Okay. Now, isn't it not in Daniel that the Messiah would be anointed at a specific time? Okay. Do you understand that if you go back to that prophecy in Daniel, and as a historicist in interpreting prophecy, you find out that date, and you can find out that date. Go all the way back, and that date, that day, that hour, that very moment was prophesied centuries before it actually took place. Because it tells you specifically that at this time Messiah would be anointed. And then it says he would be cut off, but not for himself. Okay? This is why Jesus said, when John said to him, you need to 
baptize me, not me baptizing you. Jesus said, let it be so, so that we fulfill all righteousness. Okay? But it was fulfilling what was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When Jesus was baptized, was he sprinkled? Was he sprinkled as a child? He was totally immersed. When he came up out of the water, which means he was in the water, right? So why do we say immersion is the biblical form of baptism? Because of the symbolism that is associated with it. When you go into that water, you go in and that old nature goes into the water. You're put underneath that water, symbolizing death and burial. You come out of that water, symbolizing resurrection and new life. Only immersion by baptism is the only way to symbolize those things. Sprinkling doesn't do that. And however other ways there are to baptize. I was sprinkled as a child. Um, but when I became an adult and I understood the truth of Scripture and I understood the truth of baptism, then I was baptized by immersion because that was the example that Jesus gave. Okay? Jim. The Catholic Church used to baptize by immersion until the 13th century. Do you know the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Do you know what that actually is? It's a baptismal pool. Do you guys know that? No. Yes. I love the baptismal pool. If you get to see that over there, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus was baptized by immersion. Now, John. When John baptized, why did he pick the Jordan? In the Gospel of John, it says, because there was much water there. If you sprinkled, if you just poured over the head, you could do it anywhere and just have a, a barrel of water with you, right? But John picked a place where there was much water. Why? Because he baptized by immersion. And when he baptized Jesus, it was baptized by immersion. So, Let's look at how the disciples baptized. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Yeah. Philip. Was Philip a disciple? Was he one of the apostles that followed Christ? Okay. Here in this story, in the book of Acts, you find Philip. Philip is walking, and he sees a eunuch reading scripture. Okay? Philip's a deacon? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at how Philip baptized. So verse... Let's look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Verse 36... Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water's edge. Into the water. And he baptized him. Now, when they had, what's that next word? Came up from where? From the water, right? Came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So, how did Philip baptize? Through immersion. So, immersion is the scriptural way for baptism. And as the Seventh day Adventist church, we baptize only by immersion. And we do that because that's what the scriptures teach. As I said, if you cannot find it in scripture, then we don't want to follow that. We want to make sure that our belief and our doctrine is based on the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's look at Matthew 
Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Do you know what this is? This is the Great Commission. So it says, what must a person do to prepare for baptism? Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Ricky, do you have that? Yep. Can you read that for us? 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all, nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, a person getting ready to prepare for baptism needs to be taught the truth of Scripture, they need to observe all the things contained in Scripture that Jesus has commanded. And then they need to be baptized. Now, once they're baptized and they become a part of the church, what does God tell them to do? Go and make more disciples. So listen, once you're baptized and once you become a part of the church, God gives you gifts. And you need to learn what your gift is. It could be teaching. It could be preaching. It could be the gift of hospitality. It could be the gift of administration.